Protection Amendment regulations. And the next person that I have on my list to speak is Mr Doug Beattie. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. It's good to, to come back to this uh, debate uh, once more. Uh, I suppose I'm, I'm always mindful and conscious when we look back to when this whole pandemic started and how fast-flowing things were and, and how we had to make decisions extremely uh, quickly. And, um, you know, multiple MLAs were talking about unprecedented times, um, extraordinary times, extraordinary measures that we all had to take. Um, uh, and we had to change the way we did work uh, within this assembly uh, in, e in order to keep up uh, with that pandemic. Um, uh, and we gave considerable leeway to the executive um, because of the threat that we faced from COVID. Um, we give the First and Deputy First Minister a considerable leeway, and the Education Minister, and the Economy Minister, and the Inf Infrastructure Minister, and the Finance Minister all were given considerable leeway in regards to scrutiny. And therefore, today, I am happy to give the Justice Minister the same leeway in regards to scrutiny. Um, but I, I, I will start by thanking the Justice Minister um, for coming here today uh, and moving these uh, amendments. And some of these amendments are the amendments that, that she brought as proposals, as papers uh, to the executive. And therefore, it's right uh, that she's here today um, uh, moving those uh, amendments. And I wish uh, other ministers would do similar. Those who brought papers um, to the executive uh, and then had them somebody else, uh, in this case the, uh, the, uh, the health minister, uh, move it for them. Uh, while their colleagues chirped and complained from the sidelines. Because we have a collective responsibility here, uh, and our Health Minister has moved amendments, uh, our Justice Minister has now moved amendments, uh, our junior ministers have moved amendments, and the Economy Minister, I believe, uh, as, uh, sorry, not the Economy, the, uh, the Communities Minister uh, has also moved amendments. And that's what we have, and that's what we call uh, that collective responsibility. Um, uh, and we all just need to be really mindful of what things were like at the start of this pandemic and what we were like as MLAs trying to keep up um, with what we were trying to achieve in regards to that. Having thanked the Minister, and it was a genuine thank, I must start by saying that I remain disappointed that the, dis the Minister did not, uh, when asked by the Executive, uh, head up the Enforcement and Compliance uh, Working Group. Uh, I accept this is not just a justice issue and that it involves health, communities, infrastructure, of course. Um, first of all, for his thanks, which is very much appreciated. Um, but can I ask on what basis he says that I wouldn't head that up and how he knows whether or not I was asked at executive? My understanding is that executive conversations are confidential. This allegation has been made on a number of occasions and is not factually accurate, but I'd be interested to know why the member feels that that is the case. Well, I, I, I thank you, uh, Minister, but I've asked this, I've asked this question on, on multiple occasions, and I think that's the first time um, that you have actually said, no, it's not accurate. So if, if you're saying to me that you were not asked in writing, if you were not asked in person by the, the executive to head it up, then I will say, I will say Order. Uh, sorry. Can I ask the member to resume his seat? I fear that we are straying from the content of the regulations. I think it's important. Yes, I know you were having someone was having fun, but and if I was in your place, I would probably be uh, enjoying a bit of sport, uh, a bit of sport too. But I think that we need to try and get back to the content of the regulations rather than the internal operations of the executive committee, Mr. Peter. Uh, and I'll stand to give way if the minister still wishes. Of course, if the speaker permits, um, but I mean, the member has now um, made reference to me being written to um, to be asked to do this particular um, role, which, of course, again is not accurate. Um, but it does beg the question why the member would have access to written communications um, from the executive office to any minister. Um, so I would like some clarification on this because it is an important point, Mr Speaker. Whilst it may not be pertinent to this debate, it does go to the very heart of confidentiality of discussions in the executive committee. Uh, the minister has put her comments on the record and she is right. It is standing practice and convention 
that the proceedings of the executive committee are to be kept private. Mr. Beattie. Yes, uh, and, 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 I, and I hope, Mr. Speaker, that I can just say that, you know, sometimes as an MLA, you use a scatter approach. You, you, you throw out that were you asked. You throw out, was it an email? You throw out, was it a letter? It was a scatter approach. I threw out a scatter approach. The minister has answered that scatter approach, and I will accept what the minister says, as we all should do uh, within this House. Absolutely, give way. The minister, or sorry, the member for giving way, and I mean, with the, the uh, speaker's indulgence. I suppose, given that there has been a lot of interest around this particular subject, and indeed in the minister's own words about how we've arrived at this situation, it would actually be very good if the minister would put in record today what the actual position was around all of that, of course. Well, I, look, I, I'm, I'm going to take what the speaker has said, and I'm not going down uh, that rabbit hole. But, but it suffice to say uh, the point that I was making is that, of course, that enforcement is, is not a justice issue. It does involve health and communities and infrastructure and economy uh, and finance. Um, uh, uh, and, and enforcing uh, regulations are, are important. They are a tool. But I'll, I'll just say uh, and agree with what uh, Ms. Dillon said earlier, and I think repeated by Ms. Mr. Sheehan, um, uh, in regards to in the, in the, the, the enforcement stance, uh, that it shouldn't just be uh, about enforcement. It should be about uh, encouragement. It should be about giving information um, uh, so people understand what is expected of them and what's not expected of them, in particular in regards to uh, face coverings. Um, and I suppose the police are right to be criticised when they get it wrong and they're right to be criticised if they are not consistent uh, in their reproach. But I don't think it's fair just to criticise the police for the sake of criticising the police, certainly given the fact that when we bring out regulations, they come out quickly and some of them are not the clearest regulations that you'd want to stick down on paper. So the police are certainly fighting uh, a difficult battle uh, in regards to that. Um, the amendments that we're talking about today uh, are largely redundant. Um, because come Friday, uh, many of them will be overhauled. And, and, and I, I'm not really in this place where I want to just keep talking about redundant amendments uh, purely for the sake of, of throwing an insult to somebody or, or just having a, the ability to have a go at somebody. Uh, I, I'm not. I, I think a good discussion can be had, but they are slightly redundant. I suppose Amendment 4, the wearing of face covering stoves, threw up that interesting dilemma, and the Minister did mention it earlier on, uh, and that's in regards to the fine for not wearing a face covering when you should, and that's £200, um, with, if paid for within 14 days, it's £100. But then the individual would not be um, fined again if he was a repeat offender, uh, but could end up in, in summary dealings. And that's quite a leap from a fine um, uh, of what could be just £100 to, to suddenly finding yourself um, summary dealings or find yourself uh, in court. And we do have some people who are habitual um, non-mask wearers. Um, and I guess that's something uh, that we need to be aware of. The whole issue about the mentioning of, of face masks is extremely complex. And, and, and I can't remember who it was, and I apologise, but somebody says is that we should not stigmatise those people who can't wear face masks uh, because they have a a medical condition, and that's absolutely right. Uh, we shouldn't, but we certainly should go after those people who can wear face masks, masks and deliberately do not. Um, because it's important that we all buy into this, because this is a sad issue, uh, and we need to be wearing face masks. And I suppose there's an argument for those people who can't wear face masks because of they're claustrophobic on them when you wear them over their face, is that instead of wearing the face mask, maybe they could be issued or given visors that would give you at least some protection. There's an argument there, and I think it's a fair discussion, um, but we certainly can't stigmatise, but we do need to go after those people who are, are not wearing face masks. Uh, and the last point I'll, I'll, I'll mention is, is about uh, vaccines, and this is a good news story, and it's really important that we have a positive uptake and that we in this assembly, every single MLA, leads by example to get people to take this vaccine because this vaccine is a thing that will take us out of this pandemic. Uh, I've seen somebody saying that all MLAs should take it first to make sure it works um, and there's no adverse effect and we should all 
do it publicly. And I would be more than happy to do that. But then they would all start clamouring and complaining, saying MLAs are jumping the vaccine queue, so you can't win. But I suppose the point I make, um, uh, and, I, and, again thanking, and again thanking the Minister, of course, for giving way, and I do share his sentiment in relation to the good news story of a vaccine. But would, would he also agree with me that it is important that we respect the well enshrined principle uh, within the United Kingdom that vaccines are not mandatory because there is those for their own purposes will not want to protect? Yes, of course, I think that's, that's a given. I don't think anybody is, is talking about going into a care home and lining up the residents and blindfolding them and sticking a needle into their arms without them knowing it. I think everybody has to be given the choice whether they want to take a vaccine or not. I think the point that I'm, that I'm making, uh, and, and your point has been made really, really well, I think that the point that I'm making is that we need to, to, to be absolute leaders on this issue and tell people that this is something that will get us out of the pandemic. And if we don't, if we show uh, any division on this, if we show people who are promoting a complete, something completely different, no matter whether it is something that, that, that their, their constituents are concerned about and they are just promoting that issue, then, then we will have a real problem. Because if we don't have an uptake uh, of this vaccine, we are not going to get out of this pandemic and we're going to live this over and over and over again. And we're going to lose our people and over a thousand dead at the minute. Over a thousand. So over a thousand grieving families. And we can't keep that on. Uh, and just in finishing, uh, again, I'll take this opportunity to uh, thank the Minister for moving these amendments, thanking the Minister for uh, uh, challenging my points of view. Um, uh, and I think that's the way it should be done because tone is important. Uh, how we do things here is important. How we talk to each other is important. How we respect each other uh, is incredibly important. But what's mostly important is how we deal with this pandemic. Um, and we all need to focus on that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. It's great to be doing, um, speaking on this um, debate today on such a positive day as the vaccine programme begins to be rolled out. It offers a very clear glimpse of light at the end of the tunnel, um, though this set of re regulations remind us that there's still a lot of road to travel. And before I move on to the body of my um, speech, I, it's disappointing that the chair of the Justice Committee is no longer in the chamber to hear this, because I think there were some points that he made earlier today that were factually incorrect and, and did not give a good representation of the work that we on the Health Committee are trying to do. These are negative resolutions. Uh, negative resolution statutory rules. We are not given the luxury of having full scrutiny of them. We cannot bring forward health professionals. We cannot bring forward a number of stakeholders. We have 21 days to get this whole process through. He, he mentioned he would like to bring the chief constable there. Again, we would like to bring similar people in, but we don't have that. Likewise, he said that um, he would have liked the Justice Minister to come and present these regulations today, that are these amendments that are of relevance to the Justice Committee. We have never had the Health Minister there. It is not his job to come and, and provide us with that um, level of insight. It is his departmental officials who are responsible for the drafting. And as Colin, the chair of the Health Committee, said today, sometimes that can be a cross-departmental delegation, but effectively it is the health officials who come forward to it. Yes, go ahead. I thank the member for giving way, and in the risk of probably misrepresenting the uh, chairperson of the Justice Committee, I think what he did say was that the Chief Constable had been before the Justice Committee on previous occasions uh, in relation to the regulations. I think his point of contention was that regarding these specific regulations, that nobody from the Department of Justice was available to brief the Justice Committee. The point that I made in my intervention earlier was that it, it, it would not be up to the Justice Minister to come forward. It is, these are developed and produced by the Department of Health and that's why they're coming through us as a committee. And as I made the point, I do engage with my MLA colleagues. We're a small team in Alliance. We all have our own portfolios. And so I would engage with them before the Health Committee if there are any issues. But we have to put trust in our executive ministers. They're the ones who are sitting um, a couple of times a week at present, looking at the current restrictions, looking at what's coming forward going into the future, and we are reliant on them in these very pressing, very particular circumstances of this pandemic to 
engage themselves with their departmental officials, their special advisors and others to come up with restrictions that are um, best case scenario because nothing is perfect around what we're doing to try and fight this pandemic and everything is done at haste. And so I would prefer, as everybody on the Health Committee, that we had far more time to scrutinise the regulations, but we just don't have it. And that's why we're, we are saying in every one of these debates that um, we, we um, don't think that the information, etc., is, is good enough. But we are where we are. Today we are debating these regulations that are so far out of date that some of them may soon be in date again. So exceptionally, I intend simply to run through the actual amendments we're discussing today. Principal Deputy Speaker, you'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to stray too far off it from here, since we are to assume that they are generally will be relevant again from Friday. Amendment 13 is a brave attempt at enforcing the distancing required, which has pretty much disappeared from public awareness ever since the Executive Office reopened hospitality in the summer with the announcement that effectively one metre would suffice. It is wise to be cautious about this and to reinforce the two metre measure across the board. While I agree it is wise from a public health perspective, I would be interested to hear about what discussions were held with the hospitality sector about the viability of reopening with a strict two metre requirement. We have heard this morning, any of us who were listening to the Nolan Show this morning, one of the restaurants in my constituency has already determined that come Friday they will not be reopening again for the foreseeable future because it is not financially viable, not least given the risk of having to close again anyway if there was a case on the premises to reopen this side of Christmas. Nevertheless, the whole thing does leave us to wonder why the two metre requirement was ever abandoned in the first place. Interestingly also about Amendment 13 is the requirement for two metres to be observed in queues. And I must add that it would make sense to wear covering sorry, were face coverings in these scenarios as well. A few weeks ago, the, the weekend before the departmental officials came to the Health Committee, those photos were circulating on social media. I think it was from outside Premark on the Sunday, whenever it was announced the shops were going to close. So people are queuing, uh, and again, we saw it in Lisbon at the weekend, people are queuing outside and they're posing great risks to those around them through community transmission. Um, so by definition, if we have a face covering already for entering a venue, I do not see why they would not be asked to wear it to provide extra cover while waiting to enter. The question about this requirement many are posing, however, is how practically enforceable it is. Establishments do not control this, the area outside the venue in which they operate and who indeed is specifically, uh, and who indeed is specifically um, required to do that in a queue. I wonder if we should be looking to other authorities, perhaps councils, for other assistance with enforcement, particularly around the busy Christmas periods. And again, we, we know where the hotspots are, um, in, certainly in the city centre and in South Belfast. I would like to commend the sector, nevertheless, for clearly taking seriously the requirements outlined in Amendment 13. In principle, as many have already calculated, this will mean lower footfall, but it will also mean safer custom, and that can only be to everyone's benefit. I would also like to ask the public in general not to wait for enforcement. It is in the interest of us all and of public health that we adhere to the regulations at all times, including in spirit. The more we crowd, the faster the virus spreads and the quicker we potentially are back in absolute lockdown again. Amendment 14 follows on from a suggestion made some time ago that in the same way that premises must display hygiene ratings in Northern Ireland, they must also display enforce, in, sorry, improvement notices if they are not set out in a manner as to adequately enforce the regulations. I think this is an excellent idea in theory and I hope it works equally well in practice. And again, when we ask the officials around this, um, there's still some way to go in terms of how they can ensure that best practice from one premise can be shared with the next. Amendment 15 um, is also a clear improvement requiring contact details for every customer, not, not just the person who makes the booking or the first one who makes it through the door. This is essential if we are to have any hope of, ha of using this information for contact tracing, um, which is ultimately the objective. The question does remain, however, does this information suffice and how precisely is it to be used? I do wonder whether it is enough to take down contact numbers and names and whether we should not be asking for the full address of every customer. Um, and and uh, my colleague Pam Cameron from the Health Committee as well have raised this in that this would, be, this would go some way to ensuring that the, two, um, that the six people around the table are only from two households. 
Even if we did this, the question arises if we have an adequately resourced contact tracing service to make any use of it. While cases are still over 150 per 100,000 population every week, perhaps moving towards 200 by Christmas Day. Put simply, do we have the right information and what exactly is being done um, with it so that it can be used to enhance public health and public safety? Moving on then, Amendment 16, which was only de um, debated by the committee last week, is another one which would probably fall. Um, sorry, which should probably have been in place a long time ago. I'm fully supportive of, rising, of raising the fine of, for non-wearing of face coverings where required, but I remain of the view that the regulations themselves are still too difficult to enforce in practice, essentially because they enable too many exemptions. A sur recent survey in the United States shows that case rates have halved in areas with mandatory masks, but in fact risen in areas without. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have no hesitation in commending each of these amendments to the House, uh, with my only real quibble being that they should have, it should have taken so long to get to this point. The question I would, have, uh, um, would like answered by the Minister at the end of the debate concerns the practical implications of those amendments to make us all safer and more confident about using venues as they reopen over the Christmas period. Thank you. Mrs. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and you'll be glad to know that I intend to be brief. Uh, in relation to uh, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number no. 2, Amendment No. 13 regulations, it's worth noting once again the huge sacrifice that we have asked of our hospitality trade, those who own and manage premises and their employees. Uncertainty and disruption, like never before, has placed a huge strain on this trade. And I sincerely hope that uh, this reopening in the very near future is one that heralds their new start. I am conscious too, though, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, that the social distancing element within hospitality can make a business sustainable or unsustainable, and I would ask for clarity around that two metre versus one metre allowance for the hospitality settings. Um, moving on to the health protection coronavirus wearing of face coverings, Amendment Number 4 regs, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, this deals with the penalties and enforcement, and it is regrettable that we have to have such provisions. The vast majority of people have taken on board the regulations and adhered to them, but as in life, the minority do not. And it is right, therefore, therefore that we do have a penalty framework that is in place as a last resort. And I certainly welcome the comments from my colleague, Paul, given around the necessity to take personal responsibility and hearing to all of these regulations, and that includes enforcement for some. Uh, Mr Speaker, I want to touch on the relationship with the local councils as referenced in the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 14, and it is worth um, this House recognising the huge role that local councils have played in the course of this pandemic. Many workers have been on the front line day and daily, and we thank them for that. I think this, the relationship between the executive and councils can be further developed and the provision in, in this amendment 14 but in, uh, is but one term in terms of enforcement and the provision to issue premises improvement notices where premises are in breach of the number two regulations. Uh, Mr Speaker, the um, amendment number 15 regulations is uh, welcome in the flexibility it affords to certain industries, for example, close contact services and driving instruction being provided by appointment only and the requirement for retention of client information for the period of 21 days. The opening uh, hours allowed for unlicensed premises and the opportunity for bars to provide uh, off-sales business and clarity around packaging. And I suppose it is worth um, mentioning as uh, my colleague from the Health Committee, Paula Bradshaw, has already mentioned that the contact tracing is very vital going forward. If we're, have, if we're collecting this information and intending to use this information, it's really important that we have the resource and the, the staffing behind that system to make that powerful and effective. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 16 regulations is the final uh, regulation for this debate and makes minor corrections to the drafting of the regulations ensuring that unlicensed premises serving food and drink for consumption on premises, which reopened on the 20th of November, were governed by a rule to restrict numbers of customers for, to six per table from no more than two households. 
And uh, I have raised this uh, in the past, and I would ask the Minister if she can get some clarity around what specific contact details are required in legislation for the premises to retain. I have asked this question uh, before at the Health Committee and was told that the legislation does not specify what detail is to be taken and held, and surely it would make sense to require a postal address along with a name and contact telephone number or email, for example, in order to encourage those to abide by the rules and even to actually make um, people aware of the rules because we know how often they've changed and it's quite hard even for us to keep up with them, never mind everybody else. So uh, I would um, like to see some clarity around that uh, detail that is, that is required in legislation uh, and understanding that, you know, these rules are they're, they're here for a reason. They're, they've been put into law for the protection of health. Um, I think it uh, would be appropriate that this, this useful information is provided, uh, especially when we expect to, that enforcement to happen. And enforcement is very, very critical, and we, we want to see more enforcement where necessary. But it's right too that you know we need to concentrate. We can't legislate for every area of life as we are trying to do and we can't enforce every area of these rules and regulations and it really is up to individuals to follow the rules to make themselves aware of what the rules and guidelines are and to follow those to protect each other. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker it is regrettable that these debates are effectively meaningless as they come to the house long after the horse is bolted and this frustration has been well aired on many occasions. And no doubt that same frustration will make its appearance at today's debate once again. Uh, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, it would be wrong. Hello, yes. Grateful to the member for, for giving way, and the member will know that that's a point I've made before. Uh, and can I just say, in terms of messaging and getting the message out, it's clear and consistent to the people of Northern Ireland. Having these regulations discussed, debated, and agreed at the time when they're going to be released is hugely important for that messaging, otherwise it causes confusion. I want to thank the member for his intervention and, and agree, agree entirely. And we, we know where we are and we know what, uh, that we've agreed this emergency legislation back at the beginning of this pandemic and this is the outworking of it, but certainly not where I don't think any of us in this chamber want to be in terms of legislating. But Principal, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, it would be wrong for me not to mention on this historic day that we uh, that we are in, that seeing this morning the first woman, originally from Fermanagh, 90 year old Margaret Keenan, living in Coventry, being the first person to have the COVID vaccine. And I think this is truly a day to celebrate. This is the light at the end of the tunnel that we are seeing today, so I think it's very, very welcome news. Uh, we all understand that there's a long way to go in order to protect all those who are most vulnerable to becoming seriously ill or dying from this coronavirus. And we see that reflected in even the numbers reported today of 14 deaths since yesterday. So it's vital importance that we continue to do our very personal best to keep the transmission of COVID-19 under control until the threat is much, much less. And we need to support our health service and our economy by following those basic steps and minding our hands, face, space. I would like to finish by wishing Mrs Keenan a very happy 91st birthday for next week and indeed to thank her for being a wonderful example to us all in using her common sense and, and her willingness to be the first individual in the UK to have the COVID-19 vaccine. I will finish there. We support the motion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr Pat Sheehan. free last and I suppose we've been here before. It's, uh, it's a bit like Groundhog Day when these uh, regulations arrive on the floor of the Assembly, and it becomes a bit of a blur sometimes. So, sometimes. so if I get a bit confused, uh, I can call about the regulations I'm talking about. Forgive me for meandering a bit off, off the topic. I'll do my best to focus on, on the regulations. And uh, I mean, some of, some of the regulations we're dealing with now have already been superseded, uh, but irrespective of, of what we're dealing with here today, I think we have to look on them all, all of the regulations we've dealt with, as part of a contract with the population. Uh, we ask them to abide by uh, these regulations, and in turn, uh, they expect us to do our best to protect our lives and to ensure our health and social care uh, system doesn't get overwhelmed. So, 
that's the type of, of contract that we're in. But I want, first of all, to deal with the issue of scrutiny because it seems to have been uh, an important theme discussed here uh, today. And the fact is, is that we haven't been able to provide uh, proper scrutiny or, or the scrutiny that we would like to provide under normal circumstances. But we don't live in normal circumstances. Uh, this, these type of regulations are rushed. They're made in haste. Sometimes there will be mistakes. Sometimes there's mistakes in drafting. Uh, and there are other problems with them. And they arrive late. And to be honest, uh, in, in my view, it doesn't really matter which committee does the scrutiny because we're all going to face the same problems. Uh, and I know the chair of the, the Justice Committee this morning you know, outlined what he would like to do in the circumstances. And as Paula has pointed out, that's just not possible. Uh, these arrive under the committee. They have to be dealt with. There, there, there's a cutoff date to deal with them. Uh, and that's what we do. Certainly. Would you agree with me that we on the Health Committee have tried to leave party politics out of this pandemic and try to be very collegiate in our approach to these regulations and amendments throughout this whole pandemic? Uh, absolutely. In fact, thinking back, I can't, I can't think of any serious disagreement or row that has taken place in, in the committee uh, over the regulations. Uh, we, we've had debates and discussions, I suppose, as, as thorough as are possible under the circumstances, but I can't recall any, any serious disagreement uh, over them. I, I, I have to say, when I was sitting here earlier listening to the Chair of the Justice Committee, I, 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 I thought that maybe his problems stemmed from relationship difficulties with the Justice Minister rather than anything else. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate he's not in his place here now to discuss that, but if, if, he, if he needs some uh, marriage guidance counselling, uh, I'm, I'm happy to offer my services there. So, <laughs> so but, <laughs> sure, go ahead. For the record, I don't believe that he's away seeking marriage guidance counsel at the moment, but I actually think he's chairing the Justice Committee. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, but irrespective of, of what regulations uh, we're dealing with here today. It's important that uh, everyone adheres to all the regulations, uh, and especially today, today when we have the beginning of the rollout of the vaccination programme, uh, it's late at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we're also coming into the teeth of Christmas, uh, and the restrictions have been relaxed. So. With those two things, there is a possibility that people will let their guard down. And of course, coming up to Christmas, everyone's more sociable and more friendly and convivial. And, and that may lead to the, the lowering of, of people's guards in all of this. Uh, but we have to be sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, we have to be sure that we, sure. I thank the member for giving way on something which I think is actually one of the most important points that we could be discussing today, which is the relaxation of the restrictions uh, before Christmas, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, and there will be a, a, a desire within the population to get out and celebrate Christmas as much as they can. There's a lot of hope there, but there's also anger and there's, there's frustration within the community. How important do you think, do you agree with me, that it is vital that at every level of government here, whether that's executive committee, committee chairs and committees, that we are collegiate? Uh, and our message over this next number of weeks to give that leadership um, to the public who have not enjoyed the best examples of leadership throughout this pandemic from certain elements at times, but now we can get it right. We have two or three weeks to Christmas, and it is vital and it is important that we get the message right and we're collegiate uh, to fight this uh, challenge, which is, old, which is still there and will remain to be there for some time. Uh, abs absolutely. I couldn't disagree with the word of that. Uh, and, and, and what I was going to say was that the, the message in over the next few weeks uh, it's absolutely important. It's vital that all of us are on the, the, the same page on all of this because, uh, as I said, I mean, the arrival of the vaccine has raised people's hopes. We're coming into Christmas and the restrictions have been relaxed. So there is that possibility of people letting their guards down and we, we have to guard against that. And, <clears throat> I mean, 
I'm sure plenty of people here now, uh, maybe uh, before this pandemic arrived, weren't too familiar with who Gabriel Scali was. I think probably everybody here now definitely knows who he is, and he's he's one of them of, of the most preeminent public health doctors on these islands. And of course, he's, he's originally from, from here, from the north. Uh, and he says, by all means, go out and celebrate with your, your friends and family before Christmas and go out and mix and do whatever you want to do and socialise. But be prepared to bury some of your family and friends after Christmas. And that's how serious it is. And, and that's the message I think that we have to get across uh, if people disregard the restrictions, if they disregard the messaging of social distancing, of washing your hands, wearing a mask and so on, then we're going to be faced with increased transmission, uh, uh, if not before, certainly after Christmas. So uh, that's important. And some of these uh, restrictions relate to the wearing of, of face coverings or face masks. Uh, and uh, I'm on record in this chamber of uh, having advocated uh, the wearing of face masks uh, long ago. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was actually very disappointed that it wasn't, the wearing of face masks wasn't introduced earlier than it was. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the junior minister Lands uh, introduced a, a bit of mirth into the discussion uh, some months back. Uh, about me raising the issue of face masks when it wasn't part of the regulations that were being introduced on that day. But in, in countries who have had a culture of, of wearing face masks, uh, there is uh, a lower transmission rate of the virus. The science is now clear that the wearing of masks does, according to the uh, chief uh, scientific advisor, significantly reduces the transmission uh, of the virus. So it's, it's about... Sure. I, I think the member for Gibbon Way, and I mean, I'm, I'm no, I, I have no opinion one way or another on that. I mean, I accept what the member is saying. However, I think whenever you get scientists coming out at the start of the pandemic questioning the use, I think that brings in the scepticism of people. Now we're actually trying to change that message to encourage the use. Now I comply, I carry my mask with me, I use it on every occasion. But I think the confusion comes whenever scientists actually give out a different message at the start of the pandemic and encourage people actually saying not to use them at that stage. Uh, well, first of all, that may be the case at the start of the, the pandemic, I don't know. But from very early on in, in the course of this pandemic, as far back as March, there was uh, scientific evidence emerging about the efficacy of wearing masks and, and face coverings. And in, in those countries where they're worn habitually, in places like uh, South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and so on, uh, the rate of transmission of the virus, and indeed the rate of deaths uh, as a result of this, uh, of, as a result of COVID-19, uh, are a lot lower than they are here. Uh, and there are other reasons for that too, you know, in terms of their, their contact tracing operation, uh, controls at their ports and airports, uh, and uh, enforcement of isolation, and, and all of those issues. So I'm, I'm not suggesting that face masks on their own are responsible for those lower transmission rates, but they're certainly a, a significant factor. And as time has gone on over the last number of months, the, the evidence in support of wearing the masks has certainly increased. And I know, uh, and, and, and I've heard a few members saying, you know, well, you have to bear in mind that there are people who can't wear masks. There are medical reasons why people can't wear masks. There's psychological reasons and so on. Uh, and, and, and I heard a, a, a reputable, reputable doctor on, on the TV recently saying there, there really isn't any reason why anyone should be refusing to wear a mask. There may be, there may well be some small number of exceptions, but by and large, everybody should be wearing uh, masks or face coverings, particularly indoors and particularly when they're coming into contact indoors with other people. So, uh, and, and my criticism uh, about the, 
the fact that we didn't introduce face masks earlier is again because the countries that have been most successful in dealing with this virus are the ones who have acted with speed. They haven't waited for the science to be absolutely 100% sure. If there was any suggestion at all that a measure was going to work, then they moved quickly. When the virus first arrived in, in South Korea, the government called in all the pharma companies and told them to develop a test. And the pharma companies came back and said they could only, uh, they could only develop a test that was 90% accurate. The government told them to go ahead. Better 90% accurate than not carrying out any tests. And the same with these other issues, such as face masks and, and, and so on. Uh, you know, speed is of the essence. We need to move quick. We can't sit and discuss. And, you know, it's similar to these regulations. Uh, we can't thrash them out and introduce them here in the Assembly and, and debate, it, debate them until we're, we're blue in the face. We need to move quickly. And in those circumstances, sometimes mistakes are going to be made. But that's what happens in these circumstances. Sure, sure. I thank the member for giving way. I'm just a little bit concerned um, with some of his speech talking about um, face masks and that, that the majority of people can wear them because certainly I'm um, chairing a, a newly formed group, uh, the old party group, on lung health. And there are very many um, serious conditions out there which do not, um, would, certainly would not be complimentary to wearing of, of masks. Um, whilst I wear, my wa ma I wear my mask on every occasion where I need to and where it's appropriate. Uh, I think it is good that we recognise that there are people who absolutely should not be wearing them, but it's detrimental to their health. And I also think we can't dismiss um, some mental health aspects of uh, face coverings as well for those people, even for instance with claustrophobia or severe asthmatics. There are certainly cases um, where wearing of masks is not appropriate and not, certainly not good for, for health. So I think it's important that we do um, keep it real around this and not everybody can wear a mask, but all the, those that should, um, should do. Well, I, I, I accept what the member says. I, I have no difficulty with that, and I'm quoting uh, what, what a doctor said. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's always an alternative. Uh, if you can't wear a face mask, there's probably no reason why you can't wear a visor, for example. Uh, and a visor, they say, isn't as good as a face mask, but it's better than not wearing anything at all. Uh, and, and, and that's the issue that I'm trying to, to, to bring forward here. But I, I think there are also quite a few chancers uh, who say they, they can't wear a face mask uh, and they get away with it because they don't have to prove that they can or can't. And I, I suppose yeah, in, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I, I talked about part of this, this, these regulations are, are part of a contract uh, and uh, there are issues around enforcement, uh, compliance, support, and th in my view, they are all part of the one continuum. I mean, you start off supporting people, uh, you ask them to comply, uh, you do what you can to ensure that they can comply, uh, and that was the reason I raised earlier with the chair of the TEO committee the issue of providing masks free of charge in some circumstances. Maybe people uh, who are on benefits or, or, or something like that, the low paid, that masks could be made available to them. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's an important day. Uh, this is the day the vaccine rollout has started. And I hope, and, and I suppose most people will be praying, that the timetable that has been announced uh, will be kept to. And I have to say, without wanting to rain on anybody's parade here, I have some scepticism about the ability to roll this vaccine out in the time scale that has been announced. And there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, uh, we're dependent on this British government to supply this vaccine. And everything this government has touched so far 
in relation to this pandemic has been shambolic. Every single aspect of the pandemic that they have dealt with, they've made a mess of it. And we are dependent on them to get, to get this vaccine. Sure. I thank the member for giving way. And Principal Deputy Speaker, would the member not acknowledge the fact, and I know he's been critical of the British government's and, and Her Majesty's government's approach on COVID thus far, and on some points for very good reason, but would he acknowledge that the very fact that people have been able to access the vaccination today was because of the world-leading scientists that have made the vaccine possible for UK use today? Well, first of all, I'm not making a political point about this in terms of you know, constitutional issues and where the vaccine is coming from. All I'm saying is the source it's coming from is not reliable. Uh, and I, I've, I'm on record as welcoming the introduction of, of the vaccine. And I'm also on record as saying, I mean, I will be taking the vaccine and I will be encouraging absolutely everyone else to take the vaccine. Uh, I said here last week and my children would be taking it too. Uh, I was a bit quick off the mark there because my understanding is the children won't be getting the vaccine. But in any event, uh, I'd certainly be encouraging as many people as possible to take it. M my problem is, is, is merely, it's, it's with this particular British government and the way they have dealt with the pandemic so far. Uh, and they have exhibited a degree of ineptness that's rare to see in any government. Uh, and, and, and that's partially my concern. I have other concerns as well. Uh, uh, my concern in regard to the contact tracing operation here has been well documented. And there have also been problems with the rollout of the flu job here. So what I'm hoping is that the, between the Department of Health uh, uh, and the Executive Office and the, the COVID-19 task force between them uh, can ensure that there's a smooth rolling out of this vaccine. Uh, and uh, the, the sooner most of us get the vaccine, the better, and we'll get back to, to some sort of normality. So, Akion uh, Korla, I think I'll leave it there. Korla, good. Thank you. I call Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I suppose in beginning my remarks, I too would want to mark this hugely significant day uh, when the first of the vaccines have been provided to uh, some very vulnerable individuals alongside our healthcare uh, workers. I think that's remarkable. I think it's a day that many of us have looked forward to. Uh, it's certainly a day in which general society can start to look towards a day when regulations in this regard are no more, albeit we are far from that position. Uh, but it is certainly something that I welcome and indeed my party welcome, as I'm sure there's a sigh of relief among many people across our society, whether that be from a care home setting, uh, a vulnerable individuals um, setting, whether that be from our health and professionals setting, you name it, everyone has an interest here and I suppose probably uh, we of all people in this house know all too well uh, that their hopes and aspirations depend upon a successful vaccine and getting life back to some form of normality. In discussing the regulations in general, I, True to form, I, I will point out, as I have done on previous occasions, the folly of the way in which regulations come before this House. Because, it, Mr. Deputy, or Principal Deputy Speaker, it has become a case that each time regulations come before this House, some coming to the end of their time, others maybe a, a week before the end, uh, that they're completely out of keeping and out of pace with where general society is in relation to their content. So it becomes an exercise very much of this House talking to itself. The public switch off because they can't keep at pace with how it's affecting their daily lives. It's something that is always, as members, we need to be acutely aware of because, and I, I've said this in the Health Committee, we as members of this House, and I exclude executive ministers on this, our primary function is scrutiny. And we, I feel, throughout this COVID pandemic, 
and I'm open to hear how other members feel on this point, but I think the point is shared. I feel we have failed the people of Northern Ireland, as I'm sure many governments around the world and many parliaments and democracies have failed their own people in the way in which we have been able to scrutinise this draconian legislation. It has affected every element and infected every element of our society, and yet as legislators, the duty of scrutiny very much has been lost. And, and I, I, I take a look and I think of even the uh, health committee in which I'm now a member of. And in my short time there, albeit now coming on two months, I have been disturbed by the lack of democratic scrutiny to these important issues. And I don't for one minute actually lay that particularly at the, blame, at, 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 that blame at the foot of the Department of Health, but by and large actually how the regulations uh, come before this House. The, absolutely, yes. I'm struggling with the word fail. We've failed. I don't really feel, I feel that the system is, is very difficult for us to operate in and, and the timescales as I outlined as well. But I don't think as a legislator, as somebody who's been elected to represent the people that I or any of the other health committee members, and I know you only, only joined it, have actually failed people. Could you please expl explain what you mean by fail? Thank you, and I thank the member for her intervention, but I will explain what I mean by that. I, by all means, stand firm to say that I think members' endeavours have been true, and their um, endeavours to best serve their constituents have been uh, put forward in the best manner. But what I mean by that is that we as members have failed in the scrutiny of such important legislation. These restrictions are so draconian that they require thorough, detailed investigation. And by the very means by which they have come before the committee and indeed this House, I feel we have been able, we have failed our constituents in our ability to scrutinise. Of course. Well, I, I do take the point, and we have all said how frustrated we are with the, the very limited time and the lack of actual wit witnesses and stuff. But um, we, we do it and, and we support the regulations when they come here because we know that if we waited another four weeks or six weeks to do the scrutiny, a lot more people could actually be dead and our hospitals could be even more fuller. And so a lot of this is about balance, balancing risk against us in terms of our role. I, I thank the member for uh, her intervention and her, her point in principle is well on the record, but I cannot distract from how I feel about the way in which this assembly has been able to scrutinise the regulations that are before us. You know, we've heard earlier from the chair of the, the Justice Committee, and you know, I, I know it, a lot of members can get precious about this point, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that to challenge uh, a department or to challenge a minister is a political handbagging in the middle of a pandemic. I personally do not see it that way. I think members are entitled to the right to ask detailed questions of whatever minister it may be, uh, or whatever. Uh, after, when I finish this point, I will. Uh, I feel that members are totally entitled to that point. And I, for one, on, as a member of the Health Committee, welcome any form of scrutiny. I think it was Mr. Sheehan that said it, from any committee in relation to these regulations, because I do not have all the answers. Members in this very chamber don't. But collectively, we have to scrutinise these regulations and give our constituents the best form of service as possible. On that point, I will give way to the Minister. I thank the member for his generosity in giving way. Um, and I completely agree um, that there is obviously a need for scrutiny. However, um, there is also an issue of due process. And would you agree that it may be seen, you, I think you described it as a political handbagging, I'm not going to go that far, but it may be seen as slightly inappropriate to hold someone to account um, in my position, for example, where out of an act of generosity, I offered to bring this forward um, in, in the interest of collegiality. And I have found out to my cost that unfortunately Unfortunately, no good deed in this place goes out uh, without punishment. I, I thank the Minister for her intervention. Um, I did note a comment from the Chair of the Justice Committee where he suggested that the Minister led on these very regulations within the Executive. Uh, certainly had a key part to play. So I do feel that, yes, I, while I recognise when I finish this point, I, I will. While I recognise the point that the, the, that the Minister has come before the Assembly to talk about these particular sets of regulations that pertain to, to her department or her remit, uh, I also want to put on record that 
I think it is only but right that if the Justice Minister is appearing before the House uh, to talk of such regulations that pertain to, to her remit, that the committee chair of the Justice Committee has every right to ask on behalf of the members of the committee, as I would expect my own chair of the Health Committee, uh, to represent the needs and musts of, of the own committee in which I sit on that bait health. I'll give away again for Member um, I, I thank the member for giving away. There are two issues that need to be clarified. First of all, there are five sets of regulations, only two of which my department had any direct input into. We did not lead on any of the regulations, but we worked collaboratively with the Department of Health and their officials in order to produce what are health regulations and remain within the purview of the Health Minister. Um, and on a further issue, um, it was not the case that we did not um, give the uh, Justice Committee its place. In fact, we sought advice from the Executive Office Committee as to how to handle this, and we followed exactly the same procedures that have been used with the TEO Committee and any other committee where a different Minister led in the House. I'm not standing here today as Minister of Justice reporting on issues to do with the Ministry of Justice and my department. I am standing here today as a member of the Executive, and I'm reporting on work that has been done by the Executive collectively. I, I thank the Minister for her intervention, and I have no doubt she will be able to articulate her position quite well whenever she responds to the debate at the end. But what I will say is that while she has mentioned that she worked collaboratively, and I did say in particular reference to two of the regulations, I, I feel that if she did work collaboratively with the Executive, of which I have no doubt, I feel that the Minister will be well able to uh, ask, answer the questions that members may have here in our only form of really of, of in-depth scrutiny, if we can call it that, that we have in this chamber today. I want to look particularly at the enforcement and policing regulation, that being SR 2020-253. An issue that has caused a lot of concern among many general members of the public. Because I, for one, do, inf do uh, regard enforcement and COVID compliance as a key way in which we can allow business, in which we can allow society to, in some sense, live with COVID. And you know, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have been concerned. I've been concerned from the beginning of this process that we were paying mere lip service to enforcement. But that became less clear as time went on throughout this pandemic. And I want to make reference to it because I think it's only but right. And I'm not for one minute saying that this is for the Justice Minister to directly answer, but indeed it is for the wider policing question. There is no doubt that for many, COVID two-tier policing has existed. That is firmly my view. It's the, fir it's the firm view of many within our society as they have watched the police reaction to certain events that have happened throughout this pandemic and their eagerness to enforce in some sense and to dismiss in others. I think of the West Belfast Bobby Story funeral, five months on, still no fines, still no action. I think of house parties that have happened in the Holy Lands, limited uh, action has taken place much to the detriment, actually, of those residents that have had to live in constant state of panic with house parties continually on their doorstep. And I compare that with the forceful, quick action in relation to the Black Lives Matters protest, to public swimmers in Helens Bay, to gyms, and as Mr Wales quite rightly outlined earlier on in the debate, the action taken in relation to Tandegree Baptist. I have to say, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that as the regulation and amendment seeks to increase fines, we must have an equal compliance to policing in relation to the matter of COVID. Public confidence is key to ensuring that there is uniformity of approach in relation to how the public interact and indeed. Uh, how the police go about their business and the police confidence at the moment in relation to the way in which they have handled COVID-19 regulations in my view has been dire at best and I don't for one minute uh, take away from the fact that it's a very difficult situation to police but at least do that with an even handed approach 
which will allow for a, a more collective buy-in from the public. And as we've went through this pandemic, we have looked upon key moments of public discourse which has, a change, which has had a seismic change in how the public have reacted to regulations that have come from this place. And I think particularly of the West Belfast Bobby Story funeral. Because if we examine uh, that particular time and the news coverage in which it received and the, the sheer sense of uneven, unhanded, underhandedness in relation to how uh, general members of the public were asked to bury loved ones, in, sometimes on their own. Compare that to the funeral of Bobby Story. There is no doubt that that had a pivotal role in turning many people within society against the regulations that were in place. But I want to say that as we debate and discuss these regulations, I, for one, as a member of the Health Committee, I do welcome the interventions of other committees and I want to also talk about that of the Communities Committee because we do have a regulation before us, uh, I think it is number 14, which talks about uh, the powers that district councils will have to, to rate particular um, premises to make them COVID compliant or COVID insured. Uh, and, and I think this was a point in which the committee really did try to home in on, but unfortunately the evidence that was forthcoming uh, was lacklustre at best. I, for one, would like to see councils, council leaders, being given the opportunity to inform both the Health Committee and indeed maybe even the Communities Committee as to how effective this approach may be. Because in the quick pace in which we're moving, I don't think anybody is under the illusion that uh, the COVID vaccine is going to cease the need for, for regulations in the short term. But we need to prepare society for what life looks like after January. And I, for one, will continue to argue that COVID compliance, that a level of enforcement, that a vaccination are all part of the puzzle that will allow our society to safely interact, to allow businesses to get on with their day-to-day -day work and keep our communities safe. But this can only be done if we have attention to detail in relation to scrutiny, and I, I'm open for, for any suggestions from members about how we may do that. We've had plenty of debate about the, way, the dissatisfaction in the way in which the regulations come before the House. But we have had relatively little debate as to the form of scrutiny role that other committees can play. The Health Committee has a huge agenda. Its workload is immense. I recognise that as coming on to the committee and I pay tribute to the members of the health committee that have been there throughout this entire pandemic. But what I will say is that while we now debate issues of importance such as a vaccine programme and continue to deliberate upon the COVID response via the Minister and CMO, the level of questioning that we can give that particular subject has been so strained in some cases, members only being given the opportunity for one minute of questioning. When you compare that to the body of work which must be involved in the scrutiny of these regulations, I think it is only but right and fitting that other committees be given the opportunity to play their part. On that point, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I do welcome this day for what it is with the vaccination, and I do hope and pray that we can all have a safe Christmas with our loved ones, but indeed mindful of the effects that COVID still has on the wider community. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms. Orlea Flynn. Um, and I would like to start my remarks today by acknowledging that the past few months have been really difficult um, and challenging. And I am genuinely struggling to think of anyone who has had an enjoyable time throughout the period of the restrictions. Um, but I am aware and I am sure we are all aware of the many people who have had a very stressful and a very lonely time. We have tragically seen the daily reported deaths rise above 1,000 and that true number is likely to be much higher. And my thoughts are with all those families who have been bereaved and who are particularly going to struggle over this Christmas period. As we debate and discuss the restrictions brought forward by the Minister of Health and his colleagues and the Executive, 
it is important that we do not lose sight of the impact, the negative impact that uh, COVID-19 is having right across society. And in terms of these regulations, we have four health protection regulations, amendments number 13, 14, 15 and 16, and we also have an amendment number four on the face coverings. And most of the statutory rules um, did come before the Health Committee on the 26th of November, with the last one uh, appearing on the order paper before the Health Committee had fully considered it, as this was just included on our table papers just last Wednesday. So I think this speaks to the speed at which some of these regulations are being drafted, um, but also to the importance of having an agreed approach based on public health principles ahead of time. It has to be said that the majority of these restrictions were made around the 13th of November. And as referenced by the Chair of the Executive Committee earlier, I think for many people they will remember that date, um, more so for the difficulty in securing an agreement in the Executive, including the fact that public health proposals were rejected by some Ministers in the Executive. But regrettably, it has to be said that, as we all know, coronavirus does not occur for political divisions or disagreements. It just wants to spread, and systems need to be in place to reduce or to stop that spread. So I, too, look forward to the new COVID strategy that was supported, debated and supported um, by a motion um, in this House recently and supported by all parties. Um, and just returning directly to the amendments on the issue of enforcement, Amendment 14 um, essentially designated district councils with the ability to enforce some of the existing regulations. It was made on the 13th of November, some eight months after the pandemic really started to hit. I welcome that this is now the case, but, it sh but should it really have taken so long for the Department of Health or the Health Minister to empower the councils? On the numbers of fines being raised, namely the face covering regulations, um, it's raised the fixed penalty amount from £60 to £200. And it's important to note that when we introduce fines, there needs to be a measure um, as to their effectiveness. So unless someone has the means to pay a fine of £200, um, that can just become just as unaffordable as a fine of £2,000. And I make that point because there needs to be a balance struck between introducing restrictions and ensuring that people actually have the means to adhere to those restrictions. <clears throat> that must be the central approach. As much as restrictions are there to control, there needs to be an approach of support. And at the start, I mentioned that I've, we've all came across many people who've had a really stressful time, and we know that it includes, um, it includes everyone right across society, the businesses and staff who are struggling. Um, with their livelihoods, the health and social care workers, and just ordinary families and people, and people of all ages, no matter what age, young or old. And so I therefore will end my comments um, with the same sentiments that was made by the Minister in her closing comments, with the tried and tested response uh, to help keep one another safe, um, just to encourage people to please keep socially distancing, keep washing your hands, and keep wearing a mask. Garmiogaf. Thank you. I call Ms. Cara Hunter. Thank you, um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, and I'll try and be brief. Uh, I welcome the opportunity today to speak uh, on this motion of health protection regulations. Mr. Speaker, we are now moving into our 10th month living with restrictions as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Little did any of us think uh, back in March that we'd be here nearly uh, as we celebrate Christmas, that we would be living still with these restrictions. Of course, we all recognise that these regulations debated here today are unfortunately necessary in order to drive down the infection rate of COVID-19 cases here in the North. At the same time, however, we also recognise the many hardships that have come about as a result of the pandemic and the restrictions, not least the damage to businesses. When ref referring to the Amendment 13, we understand the frustrations and challenges and difficulties new requirements can cause, especially in relation to social distancing and surrounding larger gatherings in smaller restaurants across the North. I know, speaking with businesses within my own constituency of East Derry, that no type of business has not been affected, whether it be in the hospitality sector, contact services including hairdressers, local gyms run by young families, 
the personal training industry and many other small local shops, which if not directly required to close as a result of the restrictions, have suffered greatly from a lack of footfall in villages and town centres. We would urge local business owners to continue to act responsibly to avoid a notice from their local council and prevent any behaviour that may create a serious and imminent uh, threat to public health. December would usually see sectors and businesses experience a boom in business in the lead up to Christmas. Sadly, we all know that this is not the case this year. This must, make, this must make what has been a very daunting and uncertain year for business owners even more concerning and worrying for their future viability. As my party's mental health spokesperson, I also continue to be mindful of the emotional well-being and mental health uh, impacts which the pandemic has had, resulting in isolation uh, in many, experienced by many people. Whilst Christmas is often a very difficult time, and particularly for the most vulnerable in our community, including the elderly, this year presents even more difficulties for even more people. Many family members will not be able to come home for Christmas uh, or gather together. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, as I have already acknowledged, these restrictions are both hard and difficult, but unfortunately necessary. We recognise in one of the amendments, number four, that there is the want to increase fines for face coverings from £60 to £200. We know that fines aren't uh, ideal. No one wants a fine, especially in the mouth of Christmas. So we would proactively encourage the public to continue to do the responsible thing and to wear masks indoors. And whilst this Friday sees us move into another phase uh, of restrictions, I would continue to urge everyone to adhere to the regulations, including practising social distancing in the days and weeks ahead, including over the Christmas holidays, when it would be all too easy to let our guards down. Whilst acknowledging all the difficulties of this year, whether it be jobs, businesses, the restrictions of our daily way of life and mental health and well-being that this pandemic has presented to all of us, the recent news of the vaccine and its rollout now in the coming weeks and months gives us the hope that 2021 will be a much better year. We support the motion before us. Mr. Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I hadn't intended to speak uh, in this debate, and I will be brief, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, really, I want to refer to some remarks that my colleague, Mr. Buckley, made earlier. Uh, in the debate, um, and he did refer to uh, the perception of two-tier policing, and uh, I certainly I, I would agree with him in that uh, there, there does seem to be uh, some grounds uh, for people uh, having that uh, perception. And I saw it in my own constituency just recently, where swimmers were cleared off the. Uh, the beach at, uh, at Helens Bay and law-abiding people and couldn't understand why they, they, they had to leave the beach. Uh, but the, all the talk here about and the dissatisfaction, and it's been well rehearsed in this House, it's been well rehearsed at the committees, uh, and we all uh, are not entirely satisfied with the way regulations have been brought through uh, the system. Uh, and in normal circumstances, we, we wouldn't give some of these regulations, nor the way that we've been, they're brought to us, we wouldn't give them house room. Uh, but unfortunately, we are in the middle uh, of a pandemic. People are dying. Over a thousand people uh, have died because of this pandemic. All over the world, hundreds of thousands of people have died. So I think most of us get it that we are in the midst of an emergency. But some people still seem to be struggling to come to terms with that. And they want everything done just the right way, all the T's crossed, all the I's dotted. But unfortunately, in the middle of a situation like this, people are doing the best that they can to protect life and limb. And in fact, these regulations that have been coming through the last lot of months, we will never know the number, but there are people out there alive today because of those regulations. So we'll have to, we'll have to take that into our consideration. And the other most important thing about these regulations, and Mrs. Bradshaw alluded to it earlier, delay costs lives. 
If you hold back for another three weeks introducing something that you think is absolutely necessary to protect the health of the population of Northern Ireland, you are inevitably going to cost lives and you're going to put more pressure on the NHS. And Mr Buckley used the word fail. We had failed. But we have to be careful. We have to be careful when we use words like that, that people who are absolutely knocking their pan in, for the want of a better expression, in the NHS to save lives, we have to be very careful that those people don't feel that somehow we're referring to them. We have to be careful that people in the social care sector who are going the extra mile for people that are shielding, for instance, we have to be careful as well that we don't uh, taint them with the word failure. And the public have played their part. The public really have uh, played their part in, in, in protecting life and limb and by making sacrifices. There's not a family in this country that haven't made major sacrifices uh, to comply with regulations. And our children, our children have lost out with their education. Um, they're all back at school, but it's not normal. They're not getting a normal education, and that's not the fault of the teachers uh, or anybody else. It's the pandemic that has created that uh, set of circumstances. And here we are, just 10 months after the pandemic decided to visit these shores, and we've turned around, we've produced a vaccine which has started to be rolled out today. I'm struggling. I'm struggling, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, to see where the failure is. But there are people out there who have been waiting for months on grants that they were promised, and they still haven't received them. So maybe a bit of failure there, but maybe we need to look and see where that failure occurred. Now, I know that the, uh, Mr. Puckley does, uh, and he has expressed, uh, a, a passion for scrutiny. And I think it's a, a passion that we could all share in this House, that passion for scrutiny. But before I sit down, can I just say, Mr. Principal Speaker, if some of his colleagues in the DUP had exercised a level of scrutiny during the RHI debacle and during the run up to Brexit, we may not have found this ourselves in those situations. Thank you very much, Mr. Wait a second. Deputy now, Speaker. Right, two things. Firstly, let's not bark up and down the bench at each other. Um, and secondly, the member knows that the last element of that speech was way beyond uh, the regulations under consideration. But it's on the Hansard, and uh, you've got your views uh, on the record. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, before I speak on the amendments in front of us, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to re reiterate the point that I've continually made that it is astounding uh, that we haven't had a chance to discuss the latest ramifications uh, of the latest amendments that will come into effect later this week, which will see a further open, uh, opening up of the economy and society once again. It's absurd that uh, we aren't discussing these as they come in. Um, medical experts such as Gabriel Scali, as has been referred to already, have already warned about a new wave um, off the back of these changes, uh, and the executive still uh, seemingly doesn't seem uh, that it's right or think that they or their medical advice merits serious discussion in advance of making uh, or the decision coming into effect. Instead, we are discussing amendments, Mr Deputy Speaker, as has been referred to, that were laid almost a month ago, uh, true to form once again, from storming, delayed, scrutiny and accountability. Uh, given the concerns raised about the latest um, amendments, Mr Deputy Speaker, and the Christmas break, I would ask when we are, when we are to discuss these new regulations, will it be in the middle of January, when they have been in operation for weeks, probably almost a month, uh, and the effects will likely already be felt, including potentially another spike in cases. Really absurd beyond belief. Uh, turning to the amendments in uh, front of us today, uh, Amendment 14, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, provides Council the powers to uh, ensure premises do have improvement uh, notices and allows for an enforcement uh, officer, 
uh, from the, the councils to take action uh, were appropriate. And my concern about this that I raise on the committee uh, is whether councils will have enough staff uh, that are able to carry out this role and, and function. It seems to me to be a mammoth task. Uh, and we are likely to see breaches happening across the board. Uh, and to my knowledge, all happy to be corrected. To my knowledge, there hasn't been an aggressive, uh, massive recruitment campaign across councils to increase the number of uh, staff who can deal with these issues. And I would be grateful if the minister uh, could provide some detail uh, about this and, and how equipped uh, she or her department believes councils are to uh, deal. Uh, with this, uh, the issue of inspections and, and, and notices uh, at workplaces and possible breaches as well. Uh, amendment number four, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, relates to face coverings, including increasing the level of fines for people not wearing masks. Uh, it should go without saying, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the wearing of face masks uh, is vital and an essential part of the process to stop the virus spreading. However, we have to say that that message has been stymied by the approach of the executive and occasionally their party members. The Education Minister, for example, rubbished uh, the idea of pupils wearing masks, face masks on buses uh, just a few months ago, then went on to uh, recently accede uh, and accept uh, that uh, demand and that call. Uh, sure, well, yeah. Thank the member for giving way on that point in relation to face masks. Um, Mr. Alistair, Principal Deputy Speaker, at an earlier point in the debate made reference to the fact that for many of the regulations there has been no impact assessment uh, as to the intended or unintended consequences of, of these regulations given the speed that they have come. But would the member accept that there is equally yeah, the evidence to suggest that proper use of face masks is essential because improper use might increase the risk of transmission. And that comes from the CDC in the United States regarding the many people across the country that are not wearing masks in the correct manner and therefore may be potentially putting at risk though themselves and those around them. I don't know what improper use of face mask uh, is, um, if you can define it. Um, but I mean, the education minister, like I said, uh, uh, categorically uh, rubbish the idea that face masks should be worn for uh, pupils uh, on uh, public transport. Um, and I think uh, his point about uh, impact assessments, I'll, I'll come on to uh, in a second. Uh, just to add on top of, of the education minister. Um, uh, it was before the executive, uh, seemingly, uh, seemingly prompted by the Tories, made it compulsory to wear face masks uh, in shopping environments. Uh, myself and others, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, including health experts, have been calling for actions uh, to be implemented on this uh, for weeks uh, at the very start uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and still, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the executive has not rolled out a programme of the mass availability of free uh, reusable masks, um, despite myself. We've gone on about it for months, and, and other members, obviously, uh, today and on the committee. So, if someone, uh, Mr. Happy Speaker, genuinely forgets to bring a mask while they go uh, on public transport or enter a shop, uh, where is the support provided to them? Not only will they be fined if this regulation goes ahead, uh, these amendments go ahead, but uh, the fine would increase; uh, they would be paying even more. And this is, of course, not to mention uh, as well, which is connected to this issue, the nefarious and dangerous role played by MPs linked to this executive, such as Sammy Wilson, who repeatedly, uh, openly breached the regulations and defied any sense of sympathy with people who have lost sense or sympathy with people who have lost loved ones uh, from COVID. And this is where we get to the heart of the problem of this regulation, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, in relation to face masks. Well, essentially what it does is to blame individuals when it is clear uh, that the public have gone over and beyond to stop the spread of the virus against misinformation and bad examples from those at the top uh, of society. Stronger fines is not the answer here. A better public campaign and better public reps is. And while I am on the topic, I would ask the Justice Minister in fall outside her remit, but does she know whether uh, Sammy Wilson has been fined yet? Uh, his efforts were blatant and purposeful, uh, but I have not heard anything of him being fined. Uh, or punished uh, yet. And these amendments, on the other hand, Mr. Deputy Speaker, could see people uh, who have simply forgotten their masks uh, fined. And such a hypocrisy will not be lost in the vast majority of people. I, I will give away, yeah. 
So on that specific point, um, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I would want to reassure the member that someone who has merely forgotten their mask uh, would not be fined because this has to be looked at in the context of the police approach, which is to engage, um, educate um, and encourage. And enforcement is the fourth of the four, or of the four A's, so they would not automatically move to find someone for not having a face covering. Uh, thank you, but as I understand, there is no detail in the regulation uh, spelling that out. I will go away, yeah. Just, it, it's an interesting issue about forgetting face masks, because the principal in the, in the, the, of the school that my two kids attend had asked parents when they are leaving children to school to wear a face mask, especially with the younger ones in Rangahay and Rangadaw, primary one, primary two, when they are being brought right up to the door. And uh, I usually do wear a mask, and this morning I was almost at the door and realised I hadn't my mask on, uh, and there was nobody uh, queuing in front of me, so I went ahead. But uh, the point is about someone maybe getting on a bus, forgetting their mask. It's not, it's not just a question of the forgotten the mask, and the fine and so on is really irrelevant, or enforcement is irrelevant. The point is, somebody's getting on the, on the bus, they may be asymptomatic. They may have COVID-19. I mean, I've talked earlier about providing uh, masks free of charge. I mean, maybe the bus driver, if he had a supply or she had a supply, could, could provide a mask to the person who has genuinely forgotten their mask. Uh, you know, so again, I'm raising the issue of making masks uh, free in some circumstances. Thanks to the member of intervention, I agree with, with, with that. And uh, like I said, it hasn't been provided for, for in a mass uh, way, the free, uh, the wide availability of uh, reusable uh, masks, which can be quite expensive uh, for people. And I'll come on to that in a second. Uh, and I think it is worth hammering home again. I'm happy to be corrected if, if the minister can. Uh, if someone forgets or doesn't have access to a face mask, <clears throat> Was they, they can't afford it, uh, a new pack, or they don't have access to a pack of disposable ones. Uh, rather than implementing the executive, implementing the measures to ensure uh, that people have every single opportunity to get a mask, as Mr Sheehan kind of alluded to, uh, the executive uh, is pushing forward with a strategy of increasing fines instead. And you know, I'm happy to be corrected, but I don't know where in the regulation specifies there will be exemptions in specific cases. And my fear is that the way uh, the, these issues have been proceeded with over the, the last few months, that people will uh, be fined and there will be an increase in fine uh, as well. So, for example, can we really rule out a mother rushing out of the house to do her Christmas shopping and in the rush um, to get the kids ready and out the door, if she forgets her mask or masks, uh, she will be hit with a, a fine. Um, and not only a fine, but an, incre an increased one under this proposal, uh, which will go up to 100 or 200 pounds. Um, so I think that's, that's important stuff. And how can we uh, rule this out with this uh, regulation, this amendment being put, put forward? And if this wasn't bad enough, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, when this was uh, and this amendment was presented to the Health Committee uh, last week, uh, we were told effectively that the rate of non-compliance hadn't markedly increased or shot up. Um, so, uh, where, where is the rationale? And hopefully, the minister can come back on this. Where is the rationale? Where is the uh, research, the evidence to suggest or to back up the increase in uh, of uh, fines, to increase the threshold of fines? Where is the assessment? of how this proposal would affect people on low wages, on benefits, and that speaks to Mr Buckley's point uh, as well about uh, an impact uh, assessment, or even increase people's compliance with the, the need to wear uh, a mask. So, uh, much like uh, I'm, I'm predicting, Mr Deputy Speaker, on other issues, I will probably not be able or likely to divide the House on this question due to the way Stormont is structured and how it doesn't allow for smaller parties uh, to register their opposition in terms of a vote against specific measures. So I want to categorically place on record my and my party's opposition to the ill-thought-out amendment to increase fines for those not wearing face masks in a situation that the executive has not went over and beyond to ensure people are supported at every step of the way to ensure they do have an access uh, to a mask. Thank you. Thank you. And no other member has indicated to me that they wish to speak. I therefore call upon the Minister for Justice, Mrs Naomi Long, to conclude and wind up the debate on all five motions. Mrs Long. 
thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I think this has been a very useful and mainly constructive um, debate this afternoon. I am um, grateful to members for their contributions to the debate. I appreciate the degree of goodwill that the Assembly shows towards what is a very unusual process, um, whereby the role of legislative scrutiny is applied after the event rather than before. Nevertheless, I believe it is important that this scrutiny takes place in order to examine and comment upon measures that have been taken and to inform how we go forward. In the current context, things move fast, and the observations and concerns of Assembly members are taken on board as we develop policy and work on the next set of amend amendments. However, it remains the case that it is important the public have confidence that the Executive is not acting without scrutiny. In beginning, so I want to turn my attention, therefore, to the comments of Mr Paul Given. Mr Speaker, as I said earlier, it would appear that no good deed will go unpunished. Um, and unfortunately, it seems that by stepping into this role, I have created somewhat of a controversy um, in offering to help the Health Minister, who I believe has been in this chamber almost every day since this pandemic um, began on almost every sitting occasion. Um, and therefore, I felt that it was appropriate, um, given that my own department had had some involvement, though was not in control of these regulations, um, that I would offer to help. Um, and of course, then um, the health department did as I would have done myself and asked me to take forward some additional um, and rather unexpected um, changes, which I'm more than happy to do in the spirit of collegiality. With respect to the issue of lack of opportunity for the Justice Committee to scrutinise the regulations, as I said in my opening comments, these are Department of Health regulations made by the Minister of Health. I was asked to lead a short, sharp review on behalf of the Executive in support of the Minister of Health. The review was not a Department of Justice review, and I do not believe it is right to characterise enforcement as being solely a justice issue either. My officials work collaboratively on the review with their counterparts in the Department of Health, the Executive Office, the Department for the Economy and the Department for Communities. The first stage of the review, a comparative analysis of the offences and penalties in place across the UK and in the Republic of Ireland, was completed by the Department of Health. After which my department developed proposals, um, given that we have an advisory role only on the creation of new offences and penalties in relation to other committees and departments' responsibilities. We sought clarity from the Executive Office on the Assembly procedures that should be followed, and it was confirmed that policy responsibility for the regulations lie with the Department of Health, and the role of scrutiny therefore falls to the Health Committee, with the Justice Re Committee requiring notification only. As a matter of professional courtesy, however, the Justice Committee were notified in a letter by me and a copy of the regulations made available to them on the 1st of December. All of these regulations fell to be scrutinised by the Committee for Health. We were asked by the Department of Health to make an official available to join um, for the committee meeting at which these regulations were being considered, and we agreed to this. The Department for Communities also fielded an official who had assisted with the number 14 regulations. There was no requirement or expectation that either department should have to notify their respective committee or that their respective committee scrutiny functions would be engaged by doing so. I believe that such collaborative working across departments is to be encouraged, not criticised or impeded. I am in the Chamber today in that spirit of collaborative working and in recognition of the extreme demands that have been and are continuing to be placed on the Health Minister and on his officials, and indeed on the Executive Office. I have always said that my department and I will play our full part to support efforts to keep us all safe during this pandemic, and that is what we are doing today. In respect of his concerns in relation to policing of the regulations, the Chair of the Committee rightly noted that I would not be drawn into a debate about operational matters, which are the responsibility of the Chief Constable. However, he is incorrect in suggesting that this is something which I introduced when I came into office. It is a convention which has been in place since justice was devolved, as the legal position in this regard is clear. The Chief Constable is responsible for operational decisions and is directly accountable to the Northern Ireland Policing Board. Complaints about such decisions are the purview of the Ombudsman's Office. I am both bound and determined to respect the operational independence of each of those structures as my office and position demands. 
Moving on to the chair of the Health Committee, um, he expressed his concern that these issues and the scrutiny um, process used around these restrictions um, are, I think, quite complex and frustrating um, for a number of members. And I have some sympathy in that regard, a point reinforced, I believe, by Mr Colin McGrath and also by Mr Paul Given. The confirmatory appro approval process has been put in place to reflect the urgency with which the executive has had to operate in these extraordinary circumstances, a point I think well made um, by Mr Chambers in his contribution and by Paula Bradshaw in hers. The normal assembly scrutiny has been adjusted in order to accommodate the making of regulations in short order, to reflect the requirements um, of the changing um, context in which the executive is working in response to COVID-19. Debates are held at the earliest opportunity available to the Department. The Assembly approved the confirmatory approval process for these emergency regulations, and therefore, with respect, we are following the approach that the, uh, the Assembly itself has agreed. Whilst it is undoubtedly a frustrating approach, it is nevertheless the appropriate means by which we bring these issues forward. The timing of the debate is also a matter for the Assembly, given the Assembly's own requirements for the input of the examiner of statutory rules and the timing of scrutiny by the Health Committee, which has to be allowed um, and given its space. The confirmatory approval process allows the Department of Health to make and then lay the regulations quickly. In practice, this has often been in a matter of days or even hours after an executive decision. As a number of members, including um, Ms Paula Bradshaw, has said that any delay to making those regulations um, could cost lives and therefore um, being speedy in how we deal, deal with these things um, is a trade-off against the normal scrutiny that we would enjoy um, in this House. And I believe that the scrutiny function that our committees and our Assembly provide in this, in this matter are absolutely critical and we would not um, have been taking this forward in the way we have were it not absolutely necessary. Normally, the regulations are then scheduled for debate at the first opportunity um, after the Health Committee session. Given some regulations, however, are only in place for a fortnight, this means that some will be debated after they have ceased to have effect, and I completely understand the frustration of members in that regard. Following the making of regulations, the timing of the scrutiny and debate is largely in the hands of the Assembly. It is worth noting, however, that the process of developing and scrutinising regulations would normally take a matter of months and not days. We therefore cannot follow the normal procedures in these circumstances. And these are not normal circumstances, nor would I or anyone in the executive or in this House argue that this current procedure is a model for scrutiny in normal times. With respect to the issues raised um, by the Chair in relation to my issues raised by, with my officials um, in respect to the human rights assessment um, in, regard to the human, uh, uh, in regard to the regulations, uh, this matter was raised with the Executive Office following the committee session, and we are awaiting their response in that regard. However, on the wider issue of the queries, my officials are also awaiting a response from um, the Health Department's Assembly Liaison Officer um, in order to ascertain the process for responding to the committee. Normally, with the Department of Justice, we would receive a letter from the committee clerk and we would respond in writing to that. And when we receive such a letter or indeed an alternative mechanism, we will, of course, endeavour to respond. With respect to the consideration um, of human rights implications, I am not at liberty to share the exact content of papers presented to the Executive, including legal advice that is provided. However, there is an established convention, as you will be aware, that this type of information is not shared. I can, however, say that the Executive considers a range of factors when discussing potential restrictions and sanctions, including human rights considerations. In particular, we give due attention to whether any measures we are contemplating are necessary and proportionate. As part of the review of offences and penalties, we look carefully at the level of penalties that are applied across these islands and for other um, offences that would also be dealt with by a fixed penalty. There will, also be a, there will always be a careful balance to be struck between keeping people safe and people's individual freedoms. We have heard much about the balance um, between life and livelihood, but there is a third angle to this, and I think Jerry Carroll um, made a, a reference to this. There is life, livelihood, but also liberty. 
And we need to keep all three of those in mind as we make the decisions and, and take this forward. And we should not give up our freedoms as a society easily or lightly. We should question when those freedoms are constricted. But that doesn't mean that where it is sensible, we should resist um, the cooperative kind of efforts that we have been making in order to protect life. So we do keep our balance under carbon review um, whenever we seek to recalibrate our approach to restrictions and the penalties that are associated with them. Following the making, um, the, yes, just to return then to track and trace, I think that was another issue um, that was raised um, by the health chair. Um, there is al already, as he will be aware, a developed programme um, of test, track, trace, isolate and support. And indeed, there is support available for those who have to self-isolate um, through the Department for Communities. However, um, it would be more appropriate, I believe, for the Health Minister to make any announcements in respect of how he will approach um, the motion that was debated in the Chamber and passed um, with all party support. I can, however, say that there is a COVID task force being headed up by the interim head of civil service, um, though the scope of that is to be further clarified, and that has been agreed by all of the executive. Our hope is that that will bring a strategic focus, not only to the cross-executive approach to tackling the pandemic itself, but also to our plans for recovery, which are hugely important at this juncture. Mr Beattie. Uh, yes. I thank the Minister for giving way. Could you maybe provide clarity in relation to the task force whether the enforcement element will be included in that piece of work? There will be a number of elements included in that piece of work. One of the key things, and I'm going to come on to enforcement so the member may get his answer there, but one of the key issues of the task force is not to duplicate structures that are already in place to deliver um, on executive priorities, but to streamline and coordinate cooperation so that it is a more effective and more efficient um, system um, uh, that we use. So it is unclear whether those will be rolled into the task force or whether the current um, compliance group will continue um, in its operations and simply work through the task force in terms of coordination. Mr Beattie and Mr Clark um, showed extreme curiosity um, as to how the issue of COVID regulations would be enforced um, and as to whether or not I should be the person who does it. And so I wouldn't want, obviously, to disappoint them um, with not providing them with a fulsome response. Um, I will, of course, not open up executive confidentiality, but suffice to say... Mr. Sp Principal Deputy Speaker, I have always been clear um, that promoting adherence to the COVID restrictions is a cross-cutting matter. Enforcement of COVID restrictions is not solely a matter for the PSNI. Other statutory organisations such as local councils, border force and others have responsibilities for compliance and enforcement. Those organisations are not within my purview. The focus, therefore, should be encouraging adherence, compliance and enforcement. Um, and using as a last resort um, enforcement only when necessary. The executive agreed after discussion um, to set up a strategic level group chaired by the junior ministers under the auspices of TEO to coordinate efforts on compliance and enforcement. Senior officials from my department, from the PSNI and from other departments that are engaged are part of that group and playing their full part in supporting the collective effort to encourage adherence and compliance. The issue of enforcement was raised by quite a number of me members, including Mr Buckley. Um, and I want to set out in some detail the issue of enforcement because it does um, touch on the particular regulations today. Enforcement activity should always be proportionate and must be seen as legitimate. None of us, I believe, in this chamber or anywhere else want to see a heavy-handed response to these issues. Neither is enforcement of COVID restrictions solely a matter for the PSNI. As I've said, other statutory organisations such as councils also have responsibilities for compliance and enforcement. Locally, both the Northern Ireland Policing Board and the Office of the Police Ombudsman have been overseeing enforcement approach by the PSNI and will be reporting on that. Operational decisions, including the issue of penalties, are a matter for the Chief Constable and he is accountable to the Northern Ireland Policing Board. However, the PSNI publishes weekly statistics on the numbers of penalties issued, and this reflects their ongoing enforcement efforts. I would encourage members to look at those figures and inform themselves of the work of the police um, before they comment on these matters, because I think some members would find it surprising. As of the 7th of December, the PSNI had carried out a total of 5,365 actions associated with enforcement of restrictions. 
PSNI figures, as I say, are available, but I will just read into the record, if I may, Mr Speaker. 2,101 COVID-1 notices, that's penalty notices, were handed out since March. 791 COVID-2 notices, uh, that's 135 commercial and 656 uh, private notices. Those are prohibition notices issued to licensed premises or for restriction of gatherings in a private dwelling. 49 COVID-3 notices have been issued, which, include fail which are for failure to isolate. 923 COVID-4 notices, um, that is the one that replaces now the COVID-1 notices, um, with fines starting at £200 instead of £60. 25 COVID-5 notices, those are penalty issue, uh, notices issued to businesses and or premises for breach of the regulations, starting at £1,000 to a maximum of £10,000. And 1,476 um, community resolution notices have been issued. Local councils, in addition, have collectively carried out 58,501 acts associated with public health restrictions for the period 1st of May to the 30th of November. I do not think any a member having sight of those figures could suggest that no effort has been made on enforcement. Mr Buckley further raised the issue of the Holy Lands area, which we all realise um, presented particular challenges around the enforcement issues. The PSNI focus there, as in other places, is on early intervention and the four E's approach, engagement, explaining, encouraging and, where necessary, and appropriate enforcement. It is important that if members make sweeping statements about the PSNI that they are informed comments. He said there had been limited enforcement, when in fact over 900 fixed penalty notices have been issued in the last three months. In addition to arrest and other interventions, such as the issuing of COVID tickets, the police report all actions taken against students to the universities to consider disciplinary investigations and sanctions. PSNI has referred over 1,100 students to their respective universities. Following the Halloween period, which was relatively uneventful, the Holy Lands has experienced a rising number of calls for service regarding noisy parties. There was extensive media coverage of disorderly student gatherings in the streets on the nights of the 23rd and 24th of November. I think we would all agree that those scenes were disgraceful um, and that it is unacceptable that those who live in that neighbourhood, whether they be full-time residents or students, should not have to tolerate this kind of disruption. The PSNI re-evaluated the operational response and put in place a specific operation from 5pm um, to 3am in the morning. And that will remain in place um, until such times as they no longer um, require it to be so. The primary focus of the police operation is high visibility reassurance um, on foot and in vehicles. Active engagement with local points of contact within universities, Belfast City Council and local community is crucial on an ongoing daily basis. PSNI and South Belfast have been extremely proactive this year and since the 13th of September have issued 684 COVID-1 penalty notices, 214 prohibition notices, COVID-2, number two. COVID-4, number 224 penalty notices, that's post um, the 12th of November, 62 community resolution no notices and conducted three arrests. On the wider point with respect to compliance and enforcement, the Executive set up the Strategic Enforcement Group, now known as the Strategic Compliance Group, to assist our response to compliance and enforcement, given that it is a cross-cutting matter. The group is led by the junior ministers, as I have said, and my department is represented alongside a number of other departments and statutory agencies, all of whom are working hard in the collective effort of encouraging compliance. Enforcement activities should be proportionate and seen as legitimate. Um, and I think that that is important. PSNI is continuing to work with retailers, transport providers, hospitality trade and others to support compliance with the government regulations by engaging, explaining, encouraging um, and people to make the right choices. The police will only enforce where necessary and this position is endorsed by the Northern Ireland Executive and the Northern Ireland Policing Board and is in line with the National Police Guidance from the National Police Chiefs Council. Mr Sheehan raised the issue of how we can support um, and encourage people to comply, and Mr McGrath made similar comments. People are weary and exhausted, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. The COVID restrictions mark a huge limitation on our way of life, albeit a necessary one. We are social creatures, 
and in times of stress, our natural instinct is to huddle for protection. It is therefore unnatural and requires a high degree of restraint, concentration and awareness for people to maintain their social distancing at times when they are anxious and under stress. Despite all of this, the evidence that we have seen as an executive is that most people want to comply, and so making it easy for them to do so is hugely important, and that includes those who may struggle with cost. The Department for Communities provided approximately £60,000 through USEL to make and distribute face coverings to those who are vulnerable. In addition, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, prisoners in McGilligan, who were also involved in producing scrubs um, for the health service, turned their sewing skills um, to good use in order to provide face masks. And it came as part of a community collaboration where local churches donated fabric um, and the prisoners stitched face masks and passed them on to schools, um, to uh, children's wards in the hospital and to a number um, of other community organisations. And I think it is an encouraging thought um, that those who are in our prisons are a part of the effort to try to tackle um, coronavirus um, and to support the local community. In terms of face coverings, a number of members, including Pat Sheehan, Pam, Cam Pam Cameron, William Humphrey and others, raised the issue around the debate on face coverings. The Health Protection Regulations No. 2 make the wearing of face coverings mandatory in a number of indoor spaces, such as shops, public areas and public transport. The wearing of a face covering has never been presented as a panacea to prevent or reduce the spread of the virus in our towns and cities. It should be noted by all that the executive has been advising since early in the pandemic that people should wear face coverings, though it was not made mandatory until later. The wearing of a face covering is one of the measures that we can all take to help curb the spread of the virus and play our part in bringing levels of infection down. Other measures are maintaining social distancing, washing our hands, avoiding touching our faces um, and all of the other things that we have discussed at length. One of the reasons that we didn't move straight to regulations is that there was some concern expressed by the WHO and others that whilst the introduction of face coverings does reduce transmission, the accompanying relaxation in people's other behaviours, such as social distancing and contact with others, could offset some of those benefits, particularly in cultures where the wearing of face coverings is not um, culturally normal, and therefore people would struggle to remember to wear them, but also when they're wearing them might feel a false sense of security. Um, so there are issues with face coverings, and that had to be weighed by the executive, and what we tried to do was implement it at the correct time. There is no scientific evidence that wearing a face covering can make a healthy person unwell. The World Health Organisation has issued advice on face covering and addressed some of the myths around prolonged use of medical masks. The prolonged use of medical masks can be uncomfortable. However, it does not lead to carbon dioxide intoxication or oxygen deficiency. While wearing a medical mask, you should make sure that it fits properly and is tight enough to allow you to breathe normally. WHO also advises that we should not reuse disposable masks and change them as soon as they get damp. Mr Speaker, there is no, as I say, scientific evidence that it is it will make an a healthy person unwell. However, it is recognised that for some people with underlying respiratory conditions or sensory issues, wearing a face covering can be problematic or extremely distressing. And for that reason, the restrictions exempt such individuals from having to do so. By following this advice, we can help protect ourselves, our families and others from serious illnesses and protect our health service, our economy and help further prolonged and more stringent restrictions. I want to thank also um, Paula Bradshaw for her remarks reflecting the crucial, uh, that the crucial issue in all of this is how we individually act to stop transmission. A number of members, including Paula, Pam Cameron and others, raised this issue of personal responsibility. Mr Speaker, with the rate of transmission that we are currently seeing, everyone needs to play their part to bring the levels of infection down and to protect both lives and livelihoods and indeed our liberties. It is a matter of both personal and collective responsibility. We have a responsibility to help curb the spread of the virus by maintaining social distancing, maintaining good hand and respiratory hygiene, wearing face coverings, self-isolating immediately if we experience any symptoms, including a new persistent cough, a fever, a loss or change of smell or taste. 
seeking a test if we experience those symptoms, downloading the Stop, the Stop COVID NI app and complying with the restrictions in place. If we follow that advice, it can make a difference and it will make a difference. People do need to adhere to the restrictions, but where they do not, enforcement has a role to play. While there has been, understandably, given the context, a natural focus on enforcement, we should also remember that high levels of enforcement are actually indicative of a failure, a failure to bring people with us, to convince them that these measures are necessary and encourage them um, to be careful even when they are out of sight um, of enforcement activity. It is therefore really important that we show leadership and encourage and support others to comply. And I think Orlea Smith made that point very strongly. And whilst I am absolutely sympathetic on the issue of the cost um, of the penalties and fines, these fines are entirely avoidable if people follow the regulations. So it is an easy thing to avoid being fined. Pam Cameron further asked for clarity on what details would be required to be taken by hospitality for contact tracing. Um, regulation 4C uh, number three, state that the name and phone number of one member per household, plus the date of visit, time of arrival, and number of members per household have to be recorded and held. And my understanding is that is for a period of 21 days in order to allow contact tracing. Mr. Speaker, a number of members, including Pat Sheehan and Robbie Butler, made reference to the relaxations which are to be permitted over the Christmas period and the need for people to be responsible and considered. I will not test your patience by going down the road of discussing um, those relaxations as they don't form part of these current regulations. Suffice to say that we are all aware that every contact, every personal interaction, every crowded place, be it a shop or a living room or a bar or a restaurant, every unventilated space, every time we are in those places, we increase the risk of transmission. The relaxations that have been announced by the executive are permissive. No one has to do any of this. You can maintain your current stringent social distancing, your current isolation and all of the other measures for as long as you wish. You are not required to bubble with family, and some of you may be relieved to hear that. Um, so you, you can decide instead, um, as many of us who are less sociable um, will do, to close your door um, on Christmas Eve and not open it again until New Year. And for your health, that may be good, but for your interactions with your family and friends, not so much. Well, sure. would, would the Minister, just in light of that, would the Minister agree with me that notwithstanding the, the debate we have had here and the useful debate around evidence and process and the need to carry out these emergency measures in a very hasty way in some, in some regards, that there are some pieces of evidence that has, have to be considered and are crucial and are beyond, uh, beyond dispute, one of which is that our hospitals today are at 102 per cent capacity. There are more people in our hospitals today than there are beds for. There are also, um, I think, only something like um, a very small number of ICU beds left available, and we have had 1,073 deaths, and that people need to bear these things in mind when they're making decisions over the time ahead. Absolutely concur um, with what the Chairman of the Health Committee has said, and it is very wise advice. These are permissive uh, regulations. No one has to get together, and there are risks attendant in doing so. And I would ask people to think carefully and weigh up for themselves whether the benefits of getting together with family, friends and socialising is worth the risk that that might bring to those people with whom they have contact. Many may make the judgement, and some already have, that they would rather postpone their celebrations with family until we are at a position where the vaccine has created a safer environment in which to do that. But it is a matter, I think, that we have to leave to personal um, we talked about liberty. It's a matter that we need to leave to personal judgment. I think it would be cruel and unwarranted for us to try to prevent people um, from being able to meet with family over that period, particularly those who may have, for good reason, um, a prospect of this being the last Christmas they might spend with some of their family members. And so I think we have to be sensitive to that. So I would simply ask that people do, as the Chairman of the Health Committee has suggested, and as I have said, um, to approach the holiday season um, with caution, 
Um, the advice has and will not change when it comes to hand and respiratory hygiene, wearing masks, ventilating spaces, keeping your distance. Don't drop your guard because it's Christmas, because COVID will not change because it's Christmas. It will not be taking time off. Mr Speaker, the other issue that was raised um, by Jerry Carroll um, in his contribution was with respect to the cost to councils, and I want just to finally um, inform him that the Department for Communities have committed additional funding to all councils to assist uh, with combating COVID in excess of £85 million so far. All councils have confirmed that they do and can deliver the requirements of these regulations in terms of the resources that they have. So, Mr Speaker, in conclusion, today was a useful and a constructive debate, and it is part of the opportunity for scrutiny which members can undertake. We are all learning how to respond um, to what is a novel virus, and your scrutiny contributes to how we take forward future regulations and restrictions. So I would want to reassure members this is not a waste of your time. You are not simply talking to things that have already come and gone, but you are actually um, engaging with us in terms of how you want us to take things forward in the future. However, today is also a momentous day regarding the vaccine, and that is something that I think will be universally welcomed. I want to thank the scientists who developed the vaccine, those individuals who stepped forward in record numbers to assist with clinical trials, and also to the preparatory work done by the Department of Health to roll out mass vaccination. When the, when the Health Minister is here, he cannot blow his own trumpet, um, because that would be seen um, to be inappropriate, but I shall blow um, the Health Minister's trumpet for him on this occasion. I have seen with my own eyes the work that has been done in my own, um, in my own uh, doctor's surgery in terms of the preparatory work around this, in terms of how they rolled out um, the flu vaccine. Many people talked about people running out of the flu vaccine, but of course the truth is that the flu vaccine was rolled out so quickly and so effectively that actually there were, we, we, we exceeded the capacity in terms of vaccinations. Many surgeries hired halls. Um, community halls, church halls and other venues in order that they could test and trial mass rollout of vaccines. We know how to do this quickly, effectively, efficiently. We know how to get this out to the public. What we now need to do is to build the confidence in the public that this vaccine will provide us with part of the solution to returning to normality. And I think we have a, an opportunity here to go into the Christmas season and beyond with optimism, perhaps for the first time um, since this descended on our shores earlier this year. It is the light at the end of the tunnel, but we are not there yet. And so in the meantime, I would really plead with people, bear in mind what the chairman of the health committee has said about our health service. Think about the people who have already passed away. Be responsible for your own actions and take care of yourself, your family, your friends and your community. And if we work together, we will get through this. Thank you, uh, Minister. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 13, Regulations NI 2020, be approved. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now move on to the second motion on the Health Protection Coronavirus Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the clerk to please read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment No. 4, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call Mrs Naomi Long to move the motion. Move. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment No. 4 Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. no. Mr Carroll, I am saying that Jerry Carroll said no. That is now in Hansard. Okay, so all those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now move on to the third motion on the Health Protection Coronavirus Regulations, which has already been debated, and I ask the clerk to please read the motion. 
that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 14, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call Mrs Naomi Long to move the motion. Beg to move. Thank you. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 14, Regulations NI 2020, be approved. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Now move on to the fourth motion on the Health Protection Coronavirus Regulations, which has already been debated. I ask the clerk to please read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 15, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister to move. Beg to move. Thank you. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 15, Regulations NI 2020, be approved. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now move on to the fifth motion on the Health Protection Coronavirus Regulations, which has already been debated in this House. I ask the clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 16, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister to move the motion. Beg to move. Thank you. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 16, Regulations NI 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Before we move on to the Economy Committee business, I could just ask members just to take their ease and don't forget when you're leaving to clean your surface. Thank you.